<laughs> so just again coming back uh, yeah so i see i just released the module students uh, three days back uh, and the non resident taxation module is out our module which is there is much more comprehensive enough covering all the mcqs the integrated case studies and the practical that module has got very elementary level of question not that great question so obviously the our level of module is much beyond what the ici has given it so therefore you just stick to what we are doing it only thing is that i see one extra theory chapter in the module which was a last chapter it is an extra theory chapter so what i'll do is that that extra theory chapter in the non resident access i'll put it in my next module okay so that next module which is there uh, going to come out so i'll keep it over there so that um, if it is theory so do it. we'll do that theory chapter is there so we will do it we will not ignore it but that is what it is i thought just to bring to all of your notice as to how the things are there with that now sort of we again and go into this and one very comprehensive question we are going to solve right now on the indirect transfer very very quickly students i am just very very quickly students so very quickly we will just recap the things that we discussed in the last lecture in the indirect transfer students you need to focus on that foreign company check whether that foreign company derive its own value substantially from an indian asset that is the basis of all our exercise whether it derives its own value from an indian asset is it it so in this case students what do we do <coughs> whether it derive its own value substantially from the indian asset so two things i told you in this case and one other two things uh substantial test two things when to test the substantial condition and how to test is it generally we take the balance sheet date okay but it could also be the date of transfer so there is a date of transfer or the balance sheet date before the date of transfer that depends upon whether the aggregate book value of the foreign company foreign company total book value of all the assets total book value of all the assets of the foreign company exceed more than 15% exceed by more than 15% student isn't it and if it exceed by more than 15% as of the date of transfer in that particular case we will take up the relevant data the date of transfer or else it will be the balance sheet date before the date of transfer that is what we have discussed isn't it yes good morning ma'am so this is how the things will be considered point number 2 once you have free what will be the relevant date once you have free what will be the relevant date now on the relevant date you have to you have to check the substantial condition and how do you check the substantial condition two things again point number 1 the fair market value of the indian asset should be more than rupees 10 crore more than a more than or equal to will not do it has to be more than and point number 2 is what the fair market value of the indian asset should be at least more than or should be at least more than or equal to which i will say which i will say at least i'm going to say more than or equal to or at least so fair market value of the indian asset should be at least 50% of the total fair market value of all the asset of all the asset of that foreign company is it it and that exactly is the point that is what you have discussed so students today first and foremost thing decide what is fair market value 
generally up till now whatever fair market value you people have referred it the fair market value is the net asset in the sfm also you people would have referred it this way na right? sfm net asset value of the asset, uh, of that company asset minus liability is it and there after divide by number of shares kind of a thing you people do so therefore it is a net asset divided by the number of shares this is a net asset approach to determine the fmb is it this is how we do it. however here the fair market value which we are talking about it is not the net asset approach here the fair market value students is on the basis of the entity approach entity and if it is entity you are aware of it what it is it means that we don't go with net asset we go with the gross asset because net asset may give some time a incorrect view i give you an example when you appreciate that yes indeed that's true my net worth students my net worth is 3 crores mr anil ambani his net worth is minus 5000 crores I am plus three crores, and he is minus five thousand crores. Are you getting this one now? So that way, if I have to now compare, that way now, if you have to compare, what exactly you are going to say? That my net asset is five crores, Mr. Uh, three crores, and Mr. Anil Ambani has got net worth of minus five thousand crores. You say, sir, in that case, it's a huge this thing. Your net worth is really far, far ahead as this. Yes, indeed. But is that giving the correct picture? My total asset is say six crores. With the minus liability, if I reduce, then it becomes a net worth of three crores minus liability. Whereas Mr. Amma, Mr. Anil Ambani, total asset is eighty five thousand crores. and then he is getting a net worth of 5000 crore minus 5000 crore 85000 crore asset say 90000 crore liability 85000 crore asset 90000 crore liability and then he gets what then he gets that negative 5000 crore minus 6 crore asset 3 crore liability then i am getting net worth of 3 crore i am positive he is negative by 6000 he is negative by 5000 crore and then you will say say what sir in this case you are far ahead as compared to mr anil ambani but in the total asset term where is 85000 crore and 6 crore are you getting this particular point so this is not giving a correct picture and therefore over here what they are saying so far as indirect transfer is concerned students so far as indirect transfer is concerned if there is any if there is any any what if there is students any particular if there is any liability which is being reduced from the total asset any liability which is been reduced from the total asset then that liability has to be added then that liability has to be added is that clear to all of you <coughs> so in the last lecture where you have written the fmb isn't it all the place put in aspect in the last lecture you have written the fmb in the substantial condition more than 10 crore fmb value fmb value more than 10 crore and the other one Two minutes, please. Two minutes.
So students, now then, on the FMB part, you please put an asterisk and write therein. The FMB value will be increased by, the FMB value will be increased by any, any corresponding liability any corresponding liability that would have been reduced that would have been reduced Why? So now from let's take question number six. RIL is an Indian company engaged in multifaceted business activity. Barbara INC dot a US investment giant wants to get twenty percent stake in the Indian company. Considering, so obviously this is a US company, Barbara and C dot, what they want to do? They want to get a 20% stake in the Indian company. Is it true? 20% stake where? In the Indian company. Now considering a favorable treaty position between India and Mauritius, the US giant floated a company in Mauritius by acquiring its share on 1st of Jan 2022 for peace. 10 crores, that's the cost of acquisition of the share. Shares of which company? Mauritius company. So if you remember, in my example, it was that PLC in Singapore, through which they were investing in the Indian asset. Whereas over here, that is, the Mauritius company, through which Barbara and Sidor, Bar Barbara NC dot is trying to get 20% stake where in the Indian company. See the third paragraph. The accounting period of the Mauritius company ends on 31st of December. As on 31st December 2023, its book value of the total asset was rupees 25 crore. Now, obviously, students, this is this information has been given to you to decide which should be the relevant date so the balance sheet date is 31st December 2023 is it? in which they have given you the total book value of all the assets all the asset students of that particular Mauritius company see the next paragraph on 31st of March 2024 Barbara and C. Dot transferred the shares of the Mauritius company to another investor in US to whom another investor in US unrelated at a price of rupees 50 crore. The book value after reduction of liability please, uh, uh, okay and fair market value after reduction of liabilities this is important. Huh? Highlight the word after reduction of liability. In the fair market value, you need to highlight. Why? Because if it is after reduction of liabilities, then what we are going to do? Add back. If it is after reduction of liabilities, then we are going to do a D add back. So, 31st, fair market value after reduction of liability as of 31st of March 2024 is given to them. Okay, now what is therefore when you have transferred the shares of Mauritius company, which is the date of transfer? 31st March 2024 is the date of transfer of the Mauritius company, the shares of the foreign company. First, students, based on the information given, now read the table also below this. Read the table. 
book value of Mauritius company and RIL, it goes in the next page also. So let's see. Is it it? So you have to see the next page also. So first and foremost is please determine the relevant date. Date of transfer or the balance sheet date before the date of transfer. First determine the relevant date. So what is the relevant date in this case? You have compared which to which value? 25 crores and the 30 crores, isn't it? 25 crores and 30 crores. So is the increase, is it more than 15%? Is the increase by more than 15 percent? And the answer is yes. And if the increase is by more than 15 percent, then in that case we will go with what? The date of transfer. Now, as on this date, which date? 31st of March 2024. What we have to see? We have to see that the aggregate fair market value of all the assets. Sorry, aggregate fair market value of the in investment in Indian asset, investment in the Indian asset should be more than 10 crore. Now, if you see students over here, <coughs> RIL 180. So, this is after reducing the liability. This is after reducing the liability. And if it is after reducing the liability, I add the liability, then fair market value, fair market value would be 200, fair market value before, before what, before liability would be 200, because already given in the question, what they have given in the question, that the fair market value is after reduction of liability, and already I told you students, the fair market value will have to be considered before any reduction of liability. And hence it is 200 crores is a fair market value over here. And of 200 crores, tell me how much is the investment which is made by the Mauritius company? How much is the investment which is made by the Mauritius company? 20%. In the first line itself, they have told now 20% is the investment that has been made. And therefore, if it is 20%, in that case, what is the fair market value of the investment? made by Mauritius company in the, in, in the Indian asset is 40 crores. The fair market value of the investment made by the Mauritius company in the Indian asset which is RIL is how much? 40 crores. More than 10 crores. Yes. Therefore, that is satisfied. Question number 2. Is the fair market value of the investment in the Indian asset, is it at least 50%? of the total fair market value of all the assets of all the assets of the Mauritius company. Is it at least 50% of the total fair market value of all the assets of that particular Mauritius company? And the answer is yes. How you say so? How much is the total fair market value? Indeed. Total fair market value of all the assets of the Mauritius company is how much? 50 crores. 50 crores is the total fair market value in this case and 50 come in this case out of which the contribution by the Indian asset is how much? 40 crores. So therefore in this case the total percentage is 
and therefore we will say say what both the conditions are satisfied on the relevant date isn't it and hence the morsius company derive its own value substantially from the indian asset and because it derives its own value substantially from the indian asset therefore the shares of the morsius company is deemed to be situated in india the shares of the morsius company is deemed to be situated in india now then barbara and the dot on 31st of march 2024 has sold a capital asset which is deemed to be situated in india and because it has sold a capital asset which is deemed to be situated in india therefore the capital gains arising to barbara and the dot capital gains arising to barbara and the dot on such transfer on such transfer will be deemed to have accrued or rise in india will be deemed to have accrued or rise in india today that is what we will say in this context isn't it so that is how the things has to be looked upon so yes deemed to accrue or rise in india students and this is what it is so the next question and the beautiful question is how do you calculate the capital gains in this before you do this very quickly students very quick, i think you have already discussed this so can you read or you can read later on okay already you people have answered me so this theory you can you read whatever is whatever we discuss as has been written over here the game over here for this is this now now read therefore this paragraph first <coughs> Fine. Now, students, see this calculation of the capital gain. Now, where you people will go wrong, I'll let you also know that. So, what you will do? You will take full value consideration. Who is calculating the capital gain? In whose hands you are calculating the capital gain? The transfer. Who is the transfer? Barbara and C dot USA. First, identify that. I don't really jump into the calculation part. Before you start calculation, get the fundamentals right. Who is the transfer? What is the capital asset that you have transferred? What is the period of holding of that asset? Three things. Again, I am repeating. Who is the transfer? What is the capital asset that you have transferred? And what is the period of holding? So that is the first thing that you should always keep in mind. Always. transfer <coughs> barbara and the dot capital asset which you have transferred is shares of morsius company and last one is what to do period of holding poh i'm writing so with date to with date First of January, two thirty-four. Two, four, no four. So it would be how many? Twenty. No, no. Twenty-seven. No. Twenty-seven, no? Right? 
just something on capital gains front. In fact, the beauty of our this thing is that this is the same way. See, that's the point. ICI module presentation and our module presentation. You will find I have included one topic on non-resident taxation and capital gains. ICI has also included that topic. That's quite strange. But unfortunately, they have not got no problems at all. Topic is there without any problem. We have also got topic, but along with practical problems and the MCQ. That's the difference. Okay, so therefore, this is one thing which has been there. So in the capital gains front, wouldn't just basic you would know period of holding for capital asset to determine if it is a long term or short term. So you know there are three period of holding: 12 months, 24 months, and 36 months, isn't it? 12, 24, and 36. You just know what is for 12? 12 students is for listed. Listed security. Okay, except for unit. Just write like except for unit. Just I am writing it. You can also write 24 months students is in respect of two things. Immovable property. And the next one is unlisted security. That is 24 months. And 36 would be other. 36 is for other. So 12, 24, 36. You can just make a note of this elementary observation. 12, 24 and 36. 12 is for listed security except for unit. 24 is for immobile property and understood security and 36 is other. Why should all of it through? So tell me then, this capital asset, that is the shares of the Morrisons company, now which period of holding you are, and why you say so? What would be the criteria? Hmm? No. Srinath? Srinath also has gone. Here, when you talk from this point of view, na, we listed and unlisted has to be from the perspective of listed in Indian property. Listed where? In the Indian stock market. Always keep this point in mind. Listen. When they this listed, if you want to write more specifically listed where securities in Indian stock market. More specifically if you want right. Isn't it? So one thing is very much sure for all of you. What is that student? That so far as this asset is concerned. It is what? It is a, it is a unlisted security. So for which shares? The shares of the Morrison company, which you have transferred, no? the capital asset that you have transferred, for which we are supposed to calculate the capital gain. What is the capital asset which you have transferred? The shares of the Morrison company. That is unlisted so far as India is concerned. It may be listed in Morrison Stock Exchange, if there is anyone. 
It may be listed in Morsha Stock Exchange, but that has got no relevance. We are supposed to see whether it is listed in the Indian Stock Exchange, and if the answer is no, accordingly, what we are going to say, we will say this that 24 months is a period of holding is what we have to consider it, and if the period of holding crosses the threshold of 24 months, then it is long term. So, is the Mauritius company share was held by Barbara INC dot for more than 24 months? Yes. In my example, it is 27 months. And if it is the case, then it becomes what? It becomes <coughs> long term capital. Long term capital asset. So that exactly the point of Then it becomes the long term capital asset. Now, if it is a long term capital asset, hold on. Once you will say, sir, then the indexation we will see. We'll think of the Indian this thing, isn't it? What we are going to see, many of you will think in this context would be the indexation part. Long term means indexation. Just hold on, we'll look into it, but let's start seeing how the thing is going. So, there is a special provision here, students. Now, be careful. One question that is coming in the mind of a student, sir, what about the indexation in this case? So that needs to be, that is something that needs to be explored, students, and therefore, let me tell you this then, in this context. Be careful, write this provision, 112, section 112, there is a proviso to section 112, which says this. Where a non resident or a foreign company transfers a long term capital asset being, being unlisted security. Then LTCG shall be computed without indexation and the LTCG is so computed. shall be charged at the rate of 10 
all of you through this one with that particular concept students now then Please have a look over here. So, selling price is fifty. Okay. Now, cost actually should go over here. Cost of acquisition should go below. Cost of acquisition is ten crore. Is it it? Cost of acquisition should be how much? Ten crore. So it goes below, and therefore you get long term capital gain. So without any indexation, now the danger is that you will tax on 40 crores 10 percent. That is what you people will do. It will be completely an error on your part if you do this. Why? Because just now we saw, so no? Is it that the entire 40 crores is deemed to accrue in India? Only 80 percent of its value is derived from the Indian asset. Mauritius Company, which whose shares was transferred by Barbara N C dot, that Mauritius Company derived its own value from the Indian asset to the extent of 80 percent. Therefore, Barbara N C dot transferring the shares of Mauritius Company, we will say that the capital gain which is deemed to accrue rise in India. Is only to the extent of eighty percent, and that's the reason why thirty-two CR, eighty percent of forty, and on that ten percent, ten percent is three percent. Is that point clear to all of you? That is one of the beautiful questions, students, which has been there over here, and that exactly the point. With that, now we go to our next particular point, students. Nine one two. And what exactly it is, students? <coughs> income deemed to accrue rise in India. Nine one two and nine one three is targeting which income, students? Salary income. Nine one two and nine one three target which income? Salary income. Salary income of the non-resident. Obviously, you cannot say salary income of a foreign company. So it is a salary income, students. Okay, so in this particular context, when we talk about the salary income, when we talk about the salary income, students, so what do we say in this context? When the salary income is deemed to accrue as in India for a non-resident, please read this one, all of you. So, deemed accrual would be when services are rendered in India. That is the one point which you have to be very careful. But to expand the scope further, what they have done it. Point number B, you can see. 
that the rest period or the leaf period which I follows or precede immediately immediately the period of service in India the rest for the rest period which follows or which precedes immediately immediately what the period of service in India for that whatever is the salary paid for that rest period whatever is the salary which is paid for the rest period even that will be considered as an income which is deemed to accrue as in India. So a non-resident employee is saying that okay you are sending me you mean the foreign company is sending me for an assignment in India but that non-resident employee says but immediately after after what after the Indian assignment I will go go to vacation for 15 days say to Indonesia so I will say because Indonesia is near from India so I will go to vacation so 15 days one month so immediately after the service in India there is a rest period you can name anything like vacation whatever it be is it paid yes it is paid is it immediately following or immediately preceding the service period in India answer is yes so whatever is the salary which has been given during that particular period that salary also would be deemed to occur as in India now just think of it students that's an important point many people are coming in India many people are coming in India students isn't it and they come in India for the purpose of providing their services expats employment the employees the expats all of them are coming from across the world they are put across the Indian client location 10 days 15 days 20 days and they are providing the services so the period for which they are providing the services just now you are saying that it is deemed to occur as in India if that is the case just think of it lakhs of people are coming in India and they are there in India for a brief period not that they are here in India for years after for years and all for 20 days 30 days 50 days like that they are here and they move on and if you want to tax if you go as per this then whatever salary that they get it even if they are here for two days pro rate are two divided by the monthly salary 30 whatever is that two divided by 30 for the salary of that month is attributable to Indian service therefore it is deemed to occur as in India taxable in India and if it is taxable in India please go ahead so over here students there is a big catch that you should be very careful about it and what is that they say that there is an exemption which has been given one of the most important exemptions students <coughs> One of the most important exemptions is a short stay exemption. I will just show you. You can just take the exemption type. Ten six six page one point six zero. Ten six six page one point six zero. Srinad, Ram, you got the book. Ram, you got the book right now. No, the book has been dispatched already. I think it should be received in a day or two. Now. Please go through this. Sir. Short stay exemption 1066.
Right now only focus on the two conditions which is A and B. So first of all, this exemption is applicable to whom? Individual who is a salaried employee. Not being, not being what? Not being a citizen of India. Be careful on that. Of a foreign enterprise. So even that needs to be highlighted as not being a citizen of India of a foreign enterprise. <coughs> so students, what happens is that just focus on point A and point number B. So if that particular employee who is not a citizen of India, that employee works for a foreign enterprise, if he is in India, and does his period of stay does not exceed 90 days. His period of stay does not exceed 90 days, family, then they will be eligible for the exemption in respect of the salary income that they have earned during that period. They will be eligible for what? For the exemption that they will be eligible for the exemption in respect of their salary which they have earned during that period provided provided what the foreign enterprise should not be engaged in any trade or business in India there is one beautiful question is going to come to us at that time beautiful question later on not today it will come but it will come at uh, that time I will see how many of you recall this for your provision. That will be the test on your part students. How many of you people recall that provision at that point of time? We will see. Okay. So therefore, 90 days is the period of maximum stay. Exemption will be given to the salary which he has earned during that period. Provided only one condition remember it. That the foreign company whose employee was sent in India, that foreign company should not have, should not have what? Should not be engaged in the trade or business in India. Trade or business in India. I hope that all of you are clear with this one. Fine, so therefore, just come back to me. Okay, just one second. Just one second. Hmm? Trade or business? In any trade or business in India? Yes. 1062 also just keep in mind, uh, once they have targeted an MCQ, remember this diplomats and all, remuneration because you are doing salary, na? 1062. And that is quite logical, isn't it? All the you can see the embassy office. And then they are in India providing the services. And obviously, 90 days above they are there, <coughs> isn't it? And they are resident also. In that case, you will say, sir, world income is taxable. So, therefore, what we have said, in this case, no, they will be eligible for exemption, but, but what? Should not be a citizen of India. Be careful, students. In this embassy office, say US embassy, wherever it is, even Indian employees are also working there. It's not at only the foreign, you'll find only the US employees. You find that even Indian employees are sitting there inside their embassy office. If that is the case, then whether the salary given to the Indian employees are also exempt under 1062 and they are also known as diplomats, consulate and their staff. So they are the staff of the, of the consulate. 
will they also be eligible for exemption because it is only for whom for an individual who are not a citizen of india who are not a citizen of india students is that part clear to all of you so just be very careful right? because this is where i this ici in their mcq let me see okay this mcq is already there can you do this mcq mcq number 4 MCQ number 4 for Is that clear to all of you? All of you be? Indeed, students. So, this is the MCQ question. In this particular part. So, students, do one thing. MCQ number 7 
Sıfırın orada altı. So, para answer is? B. Because he, the citizen of India is a game, no? Yeah. Both are Indian citizens. So? So, but because double taxation is there, in this case, Let's look upon to this question here. In this case. So, if you see over here, Indian citizen have been appointed as senior officials of country A embassy and country B embassy, respectively in India in October 2023. Mr. Harry and Mr. Sujay are subject to, uh, are subjects of country A and country B respectively and are not engaged in any other business or profession in India. Remuneration received by Indian official working in Indian embassy is exempt, but in country B is taxable. The tax treatment of remuneration received by Mr. Harry and Mr. Sujay from embassies of country A and country B respectively in India for the previous year 2024 is in this context. So, the fact that here you are an Indian citizen. Therefore, in this context, that 1062 is not applicable. As simple as that, in this situation. Now, over here, D remuneration received by, this is, that has got no relevance right here. Because what you are looking in is this, that because the taxability is there in that country. We, this is not a condition of the exemption of 1062. 1062 only has that, that if you are a staff of the consulate, then your salary income will be exempt only if, only what? You are not a citizen of India. That's the only criteria. Then all this information which is given that in that country it is taxable, in this country it is not taxable, has got no relevance in this context. In fact, not at this stage, we have referred any provision wherein this condition is there. In this case, how? Yes, there will be double taxation. For that, they will get double taxation relief. How they will get the relief? For that, there is a different chapter altogether. Isn't it? We will see that double taxation relief. But presently, is it taxable under the income tax act? That is the answer. <coughs> With that document, let's move forward. So, what you can do is that here. That was page 1.60, no? Hmm? Here itself, you will write. Also refer. Section and page Allow what was the MCQ number? 4 and 7? 
You can just make a reference MCQ4 and MCQ7. Line one three, you have seen that. If the government of India is paying the salary to to a citizen of India who may have rendered a service outside India, doesn't matter. Because who is the payer? Government of India. And if the government of India is a payer, then the salary income of that particular citizen of India who may have rendered the services outside India, that salary income is always deemed to accrue in India. So the embassy staff outside India, these embassy staff, they are a citizen of India? Yes, they are citizen of India. And because that they are citizen of India, the government of India making the payment of the salary to these embassy staff who are rendering the services outside India, will they be considered as an income which is deemed to as in India? And the answer is yes. I hope that all of you are clear with this one. Isn't it? Now, if you see below this, there is an exemption. Now, put it one thing you will always appreciate. <coughs> the basic salary of all the embassies are the same. It doesn't change. It. Basic. Huh? What changes is the allowances and the perquisites. The embassy of USA, Indian embassy of USA versus Indian embassy to Nepal. Obviously, huge difference in terms of the percolate and the allowance. The Indian embassy in USA will be getting more than 10 times or 20 times of the allowance and the perk which the Indian embassy to the Nepal has been given. You will agree? And therefore, in this case, this is where the disparity arises. But that is because they need to maintain the standards in US. That is very important. They need to match up with the other embassies across the world. And hence, hence what? Hence, this is again. Hence, hence. And accordingly, what do we say? We say about the exemption of section 107, which is that any allowances or perquisite which is paid, which has been paid, will be exempt. Any allowance of purpose which is in paid will be exempt. Okay. 914 also. You have discussed students if you remember this. Dividend. Remember phase 3. In the business connection. Phase 1, phase 2, phase 3. I gave you that example. Then that branch in India became a company. The branch in India students became a company. Do you all agree? And when the branch in India, if then when they became a company at that point of time, see, the branch in India when they became a company student at that point of time, what happened? The, yeah, the profit was taxable in the hands of the company, the Indian company, even if it was a subsidiary, but it is an independent to that foreign company. So that profit earned was taxable separately in the hands of the Indian company. And thereafter, the Indian company was distributing the dividend to that foreign company. Whether that dividend is it an income of that foreign company which is deemed to accrue rise in India? Check 914. What 914 says? Quickly. All of you agree? Fine. So this is what it is. And therefore, it is taxable in India. Is that point clear to all of you students? Fine. So this is what it is. Now students, once you are done with this, so you now see, uh, just imagine this 911 was a real game. The rest of the sections are getting closed very quickly. What was in 911? Business connection. Remember that chart of forgotten by now. Business connection includes and it excludes. Isn't it? It excludes specified activity wherein they are using the word activity which is confined confined to that's it nothing more if there is anything more then the benefit of exclusion will not be available 
if there is anything more then the benefit of the exclusion will not be available students in the include side dependent agent performing the specified activity on behalf of the non resident and what about the next one significant economic presence in the significant economic presence what was other the two factors which may give rise to the significant economic presence of the non resident turnover that is the say the turnover should be more than rupees 2 crores in respect of the aggregate supply of goods or services which has been given to whom to a person in india in that particular case the turnover if it is more than rupees 2 crores that can give rise to a significant economic presence the second example was the number of users in india minimum 3 lakh yes what about the dependent agent which is the first activity of the dependent agent the first activity of the dependent agent he should play what he should play a principal role which should lead to the conclusion of the contract all agree play a principal role which should lead to what lead to the conclusion of the contract that is what point number 1 was all about i hope that all of you are clear with this one fine students so therefore this is how the things has to be looked upon so now with that thing we come down to our last segment potentially this will be the last segment of section 9 and what is that interest income 915 royalty income 916 and fees for technical service income 917 so when these income now this is how you have to be careful about it sir when these income will be deemed to have accrued or rise will be deemed to have accrued or rise to the non resident in india when these income will be deemed to have accrued or rise to the non resident in india now for that purpose students if you see very carefully 915 916 and 917 this is such a unique thing first of all these are like a passive income we have discussed this thing you know, in the active business outside india test these income in a way constitute a passive income these income in a way constitute what a passive income isn't it so students over here if you if you can recall you have to target first whom how do we see the pay payment we are talking about the pay who has to be a non resident because it is for the non resident pay or the non resident recipient who is pay payments recipient whether these income for these non resident pay or non resident recipient is it deemed to accrue as in india deemed accrue is it it deemed accrual is what we are seeing right now so the deemed accrual will depend upon will depend upon on what who is the payer of it the deemed accrual of these income in the hands of whom in the hands of the non resident pay or non resident recipient will depend upon depend upon what who is the payer of the amount on that basis we will take the discussion further therefore if the payer is who is the payer government let's only target for the government if the government is paying interest to the non resident which means that the government has taken a loan if the government is paying interest to the non resident what does it mean it means that the government has taken the loan government is paying fees for technical services it means that the government has taken some services from the non resident now whether the government is making this payment 
of interest of royalty of fees for technical service to whom they are making the payment to the non resident then irrespective of irrespective of what irrespective of whether they are making the whether they are making these payments irrespective of whether they are making these payments for for the business or a source the business or in india or whether they are making the business or a source outside india will it change the answer if the government is a payer will it change the answer income will always income will be always be deemed to have accrued or as in india or as in india is that what clear to all of you friends every one of you friends so this is what it is so this is how the things has to be considered in this regard if the government is the payer <coughs> Can you see the catch of the question? No, just hold on. Students, therefore, if the government has taken a loan, you know, my Indian government, what they do? They do lot of projects outside India also. So they want to set up a power plant in Bangladesh or in Nepal. For that, Indian government has taken a loan from a for former. foreign institution loan was taken for what purpose to set up a power plant where outside india on that loan they are making the payment of interest so whether that interest amount which is been paid whether that interest amount which is been paid will that be an income which is deemed to accrue as in india Will that be an interest income? Interest is paid not to the foreign institution. So for them it is an income. They are the non-resident payee. So whether this interest income, interest amount paid by government of India to these foreign institution, whether for them is it an income which is deemed to accrue as in India? And the answer is yes. Why? Who is the payer? What What is the payment? Payment is interest. If the payment is interest, then who is the payer? Government of India. that's it then we don't ask further question whether it was loan was taken for a project in india or project also right <coughs> why should it that exactly the point that exactly the point i hope that all of you are clear with this sir So therefore this is what it is now just think of it if the loan was taken not by government of india but it was taken by whom by say resident say tata power tata power wants to do a particular project in bangladesh 
they want to set up a plant in Bangladesh. For that they are taking a loan. Loan was taken from that financial institution. And now in respect of that loan they are paying the interest. First of all now interest is received by whom? By the foreign company who is a non-resident. Pay is a non-resident. Okay. Who is a payer in this case? Payer is a resident. Now is this payment made in respect of the business carried out on outside India or a source which is outside India? And the answer is yes. This payment which has been made by resident that is startup power is in respect of respect of the business or a source which is situated outside India. And if that is the case, if the payer if he is a resident and it is making a payment of interest to a non-resident in respect of, in respect of what? A business <coughs> or a source which is situated outside India, then the income will be deemed to accrue arise in India. Deemed to accrue arise outside India. So it will not be taxed in India. It will not be taxed in India. Is that clear to all of you? I'll give you one more example. Like Taj Hotel, students, Taj Hotel has got properties across the world. Okay, across the world. So Taj Maldives. So Maldives also they have got a property. So what they are doing is that students, the Taj group who are resident in India, resident in India, what they are doing, do you remember? They are appointing an architect firm. They are appointing whom? An architect firm to provide an architect service in respect of their Maldives property. Taj group therefore has appointed a German architect firm the German architect firm where was supposed to do what? Was supposed to provide the architect service in respect of Taj Maldives property. Okay. So for that, Taj Group paid fees for technical service. Architect service is a technical service. So they paid the amount. That amount will be characterized as a technical service. And because it is a technical service, therefore the question to all of you is whether that FTS income paid by Taj Group resident in India in respect of their Maldives property whether that FTS income in the hands of the German architect firm will it be an income which is deemed to accrue in India? Hmm? Okay. And the answer is no, isn't it? Why? Because it is in respect of a yeah, property, a business or a source outside India. Outside India students. And that is the reason why students, that is the reason why what we are going to say? That this FTS income, <coughs> this FTS income that you have paid to whom? To the German architect firm will not be deemed to accrue arise in India.
will not be deemed to accrue rise in India. Is that point clear to all of you students? This FTS income will not be deemed to accrue rise in India. Now my last example. Try to answer this. JW Marriott is also an international hotel chain. Marriott Group. So this is an international hotel chain. Based in US, say for example. Now JW Marriott USA wants to set up a new hotel in Delhi. For that, they appointed a US architect firm, stating that we want architect service for our hotel in Delhi. So JW USA appointed architect based out of USA to provide architect service in respect of the hotel in India. For that purpose, JW USA is providing, is paying the consideration. This consideration will be consideration for fees for technical service. It will be consideration for fees for technical service. Who is the payer? Payer of the amount? Non-resident. JW Marriott USA. Payer is a non-resident. Pay is a non-resident. Both the payer and pay is a non-resident in this case. So whether the fees for technical service income, whether it will be deemed to accrue as in India, in this case, payer is a non-resident, pay is also non-resident. So whether in the hands of the pay non-resident, that is the architect firm, whether this FTS income Will it be deemed to have accrued or arise in India? To so that student's answer is yes. And why we say so? Because it is in respect of a business in India or a source in India. So even if the payer is a non-resident, who is a payer? Payer is a non-resident. Pay is a non-resident. But it is in respect of a business or a source in India and because it is in respect of a business or a source in India therefore the FTS income will be deemed to accrue rise in India the FTS income will be deemed to have accrued or arise in India students I hope that all of you are clear with this one now every one of you so therefore this is what it is in this regard <coughs> so therefore this is what it is now now everything was going fine through this principle suddenly a judgment comes in 2007 of the supreme court in Ishikawa Jima Hariyama Industries Limited now what was that judgment student? Very peculiar thing happened. This Japanese company entered into an agreement with the Indian company. And the name of the Indian company was Petronet. Indian company Petronet. So Japanese company entered into what? Into an agreement with the Indian company Petronet. As per that agreement students, as per that agreement, the Indian company 30 employees were put up in Japan, in the Kyoto, location was Kyoto, Japan, in their plant, whose plant, Japanese company's plant, to provide a technical training to the 30 employees of Petronet. And this training was for laying of the pipeline. Laying of the pipeline. 
this was a kind of the training that was provided by the Japanese company to the employees of Petronet. Services were being rendered where in uh, outside India. After that, Acha, this uh, Japanese company didn't had any permanent establishments in India. No branch, no offices in India. Nothing. Okay. No branch, no offices in India. The consideration that the Indian company paid, the consideration that the Indian company paid to the Japanese company, were also directly paid outside India. <coughs> the consideration which the Japanese company paid to the Indian company, were also paid directly where outside India. So, services rendered outside in India, amount received outside in India. Now, the consideration is a technical service, fees for technical service. The consideration is what? Is nothing but a fees for technical service. Service was outside India. Second, consideration paid outside India. The Supreme Court in this case has held. That because the services are rendered outside India, the amount is received outside India. Therefore, therefore what? There is no income which is deemed to accrue as in India. There is no income which is deemed to accrue as in India. This is what the Supreme Court held. There is no income which is deemed to accrue as in India. This is what was the scenario. The government felt a shock. That suddenly from where this Supreme Court came up with this finding that the services should be in India or all, please tell me here are we looking from the for the case of interest, royalty or FTS, are we checking where, where the services are provided? Are we checking that? Where the services are getting provided? We don't check that. What we are checking is that the services which are being provided, is it in respect of, is it in respect of a business or a source situated in India or it is in respect of business or a source situated outside India. Actual providing of the service may be wherever it be. Today I can provide this online services. I can be here and I can provide services for a client in USA. So in that case, where the service is provided, is it that is considered over here for deemed accrual test? No, it is not where the services are provided, it is what? It is the services that has been provided, is it in respect of the business or a source in India or not? That is what has to be seen. That whether the service, is it in respect of a business or a source in India or it is for a business or a source outside India. <coughs> if it is in respect of a business or a source in India, if it is in respect of a business or a source where in India, then irrespective of where the services are provided, we don't care. The service will be provided in Japan, the service will be provided in the USA. But is it for the business of India? In this example, Japanese company was it in this <coughs> was it in respect of a business or a source in India? So that the answer is yes. And if that is the okay, case, then where the services are provided is irrelevant. Then. Point number one: whether that non-resident has got a permanent expiration to supersede the judgment of the Supreme Court. Please read this one carefully.
Read it. Could we just put an arrow and write a note here? Therefore, once it is established that, therefore, once it is established that. The services, the services has been obtained. The services has been obtained in respect of services has been obtained in respect of. The business or a source situated in India business or a source situated in India, then then. Irrespective of, irrespective of Irrespective of where the services are actually provided by the non-resident, where the services are actually provided by the non-resident, or or whether the non-resident has. Or whether the non-resident has any resident or a place of uh, has got any resident or place of business in India, comma. The the interest royalty or the FPS income interest royalty or the FPS income of the non-resident. Shall deem to be, shall deem shall be shall deem to be accrued or rise in India. Point one, all of it true. So this is what it is in this regard. So friends, over here now, 
See the catch of the question, one of the question in the exam. A small question was asked in the exam, so I have put across the catch of the question. Isn't it? So that is already explained. Self-explanatory. We have done this one. This was one of the question that was targeted in the examination. So instead of putting a question, I have put across a catch of the question. But if the government is a payer, then students in this case, if the government is paying the interest, then then what will happen? If in this case, same question, catch of the question. If the government would have been the payer, then the deemed to accrue as in India. The interest will be deemed to have accrued as in India. If the government would have been the payer, student, just be very careful. Because then we don't see if the government is a payer, then we don't see whether it is for the source in India or source outside India. We don't see that. If the government of India is a payer, for the resident or the non-resident payer, we have to then see whether they are making the payment in respect of the business or a source in India or also in India. On that basis, the conclusion has to be drawn. Okay. Now one last point I am going to discuss with all of you right now and that, that other aspect we will discuss it in the next session, this one. What exactly is the game? I give you the example for this over here. So this, this is India, this is USA. So let's take an example. This city bank. City Bank head office in USA. City Bank branch in India. Is it? Now, City Bank USA is giving a loan of rupees four hundred crore. To City Bank India, the branch. Obviously, they are what the branch is doing. Banking business in India. Branch, what they are doing? Banking business in India. And then there after students, the City Bank branch is paying the interest. Interest paid out of the forty four. Okay. Now the question over here is that whether this interest of forty crore will it be Will it go under nine one five? So what is your take? So truth over here if you see 
very carefully what you will get it they say that everything is fine but the parent p are the same person because that the parent p are the same person head of the branch is same person no? we require two distinct person are they two distinct person answer is no and because they are not two distinct person therefore therefore what therefore the income will not be deemed to accrue rise in india that is what was the observation of the court and therefore therefore the explanation came and what was the explanation that establishment of a person be careful huh? establishment of a person in india and it's another establishment outside india will be deemed to be what deemed to be a distinct person so there in idt gst that is also there in gst also this is being there okay so therefore now you you can see on this backdrop please read this one all of you students all of you are going to write this provision over here what i am writing here in the board all of you are going to write
स्टूडेंट देर फोर इन दिस केस दिस इज एन इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट वाई इज इट सो बिकॉज एज फार एज दी एज फार एज दी आईडीटी इज कंसर्न वॉट आई हैव गिवन यू इन द नोट बी कैपला इन आई डी टी डजेंट अप्लाई इन आई डी टी एंटायर केसेस you will realize that this is only for banking company whereas in the case of idt the gst for all the cases if a branch in india or a head office in india and another branch or other establishment outside india if they are doing a transaction then they are deemed to be a distinct person deemed to be a distinct person Whereas income tax, it is only applicable for one case, which is the case where the SSC is engaged in the banking business. That is the reason why this note has been given to all of you. Now, so therefore, now we are done with this thing. So, interest. Do one thing. You have got sticky notes. No sticky notes. The yellow color. Interest royalty in FTA students. So, right. Like, In the thing, where you write? I tell you. So there is no space to write. Anyways, interest, royalty, and FTA checklist is this. Three things you have to see, and the question comes in the examination in any one of the three. One is when these income. when this income is deemed to accrue or arise in india when this income is deemed to accrue or arise in india that is point number 1 second is characterization of the amount as interest royalty and fts and the last one for this assessment of interest royalty and fts income of non resident assessment of interest <coughs> interest royalty and fts income of non resident these three things students you have to identify in the question any one of you have to identify the question as to on which that the question has been targeted i am telling you again and again students here what we have discussed is right now is the first one when the interest royalty and fts income is deemed to have accrued as in india is that clear to all of you students so identification is what will be required in this particular case identification is what will be required students in this particular case about whether the income will be deemed to have accrued in india or the income would be deemed to have accrued outside india okay before now we conclude students i give you last example and then we are conclude it with this because that's an examination question i'm discussing now with all of you on the first point huh? because this is what we did so tomorrow we are going to do 2 and 3 both and we'll done with this in the examination you will find the question could be either in one two or three you have to first identify where exactly the question the problem of the students is that the question is on one and they are answering on three absolutely relevant and the beauty is that the question is on two and they are answering one or three beating around the bush you don't get a single mark for that huh? just because you have written something on interest hold in fts that doesn't mean that you will be getting a some mark you need to be as relevant as possible as precise as possible in your answer so therefore from your clutter of knowledge or your thought you need to be very precise into what the question is and this is the answer now students over here if you see very carefully one question i'm just giving it to you this was a german one example just an example 
this was a german firm german firm which is there so this is indian client <coughs> they provided the services it was technical in nature to the indian client Now, fifty percent of the services were offshore, and fifty services were fifty percent of the services were onshore. Fifty <coughs> percent of the services were offshore. And fifty percent of the services were onshore. What do you mean by this? Offshore and onshore. When you use the word onshore, Pudum, in this case, <coughs> offshore means outside India. Onshore means in India. Are you clear with this one? Now, with that particular point, children, offshore and onshore. You tell me then, in this context, what you are going to say? Whether the income will be deemed to accrue as in India? Oh, sorry, in this case, what? Okay, one more point. Let me give you one more point here. Separate bill, separate invoice, and separate invoice. For both, say the value was here fifty thousand dollars and fifty thousand dollars. So, for them, now you say. Quickly, whether he says that only fifty thousand dollar, only fifty thousand dollar should be taxable in India. <coughs> What is your take? Only fifty thousand dollar <coughs> is taxable. Is it correct? Because whatever he has provided services while he was in India, only that much of the amount should be taxable. Hmm? Services are technical service, but but he provided service while he was there in Germany. Sitting in Germany, he provided the service. He says that only this much should be taxable. That is his contention that only this much should be taxable. Is this contention correct? Is a question over here for all of us. Is it correct? No. Why is it so? In this case, and the same thing. Where the services are rendered. Ram Prinath, where the services are rendered has got no relevance for the purpose of royalty, interest, and FPS for salary income. Where was important? Remember nine one two for salary income. That where was important? Services rendered, but so far as FPS is concerned, we don't care where the services are rendered. Is a service who is the payer of the amount? Is an Indian client. That's it. And the payment was in respect of the business or a source in India. If the question is silent, we will assume that only. Then, irrespective whether 
it is an onshore service or it is offshore service for which the payment is made the entire amount will be deemed to have accrued arise in india so you have to be very much careful in writing this answer please write answer below this the payer is an indian client <coughs> the payer is a is an indian client that is a resident in india What is it? Payer is an Indian company and resident in India, making a payment of FTS, making a payment of FTS making the payment of FTS. Making the payment of FTS to to the German German firm. Full stop. Next slide. The FTS is paid. The FTS is paid in respect of in respect of their business in India. In respect of their business in India. Full stop. Next slide. Accordingly. The FPS income, accordingly, the FPS income of USD one lakh of USD one lakh will deem to be accrued or arise in India. Will deem to be accrued or arise in India. Irrespective of, irrespective of whether the German firm has provided the services in India. Uh, rendered use the word rendered has rendered the services in india or outside india full stop further it is also irrelevant further it is also irrelevant to ascertain Whether the German firm, whether the German firm has any business connection, has any business connection, or. a permanent establishment 
or a permanent establishment in India. Point for so this is what it is. We are done with this particular part now. And this is how you have to write the answers also. The presentation I have given you how to write the answer. Focus on this. Don't start with this offshore and onshore. Huh? Directly hit the provision. Who is the payer? And the payment is in respect of what? That's only two things. Once you are done with this, then after follow it up with the what the questioner has provided for. If you don't know how to write the answer, you are in a very much difficult zone, even if you may have understood the provision. So the art is how to write the answer. And accordingly, I have taught you right now. And what is that? Number one is who is the payer and the payment is in respect of what? That's how I have started off. You may not be conscious when I was giving you the note, but I was very much conscious when I was dictating the note. In this case, the first two sentences are signifying on those lines. And then I have pulled up the remaining data of the question. <coughs> and once, <coughs> once, it, once it is established, once it is established that the income is deemed to have accrued in India, entire 1 lakh dollar, then the irrelevant point, I have told you what is the irrelevant point? Where is the service rendered in India or outside India? Irrelevant point. And further, although not nothing to do with the question, question doesn't say that, isn't it? What is that further about business connection and physical residence, physical place of business in India, whatever? That was not required. But the problem is that you may, in fact, write the second sentence as the first one. Remember that. You may say that the non-resident does not have what place of business. Or a business connection in India first, and then you write rendered. In this question, what is important? Rendered. Where he is rendering the services outside India or in India is irrelevant. This is what you have to put it first. And then, if you want to write, depending upon the marks, further, it is also irrelevant. Also irrelevant, although not given in the question. Okay, so you have to should be very careful on your presentation part. Easy to understand, difficult to present is the conclusion of all these what we are discussing it right now. Right? So always note the first sentence, second sentence, how the formation is happening and how the subtle way the conclusions are happening on that basis. So everything has been given to you with a reason for it. Okay? So see you then tomorrow. Tomorrow we will be doing about that second and third one, characterization and the assessment part. See you then tomorrow.